Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Curling for Change podcast. My name is Will Robertson, and today we're having a conversation because curling, we need to talk about sexism and curling in particular. And with me for this conversation is Amy Nixon, Al Cameron, and Laurie St. Georges. And I'm very honored to have them with me today, but also very excited for this conversation. Wherever you're listening to this too, please, uh, if you do enjoy the conversation or you find it interesting, share it, like it, send it to someone you think may benefit from the conversation. It all helps and it's all very important to the impact that this Curling for Change podcast can have and I greatly appreciate it. So without further ado, let's get into our conversation today. Uh, we're going to do some introductions quickly. Um, Amy, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Amy Nixon. I live in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. First came to curling growing up in Saskatchewan, uh, sort of the stereotype of my whole family curled. My dad and my brother, my dad ran a kids learn to curl program and I got hooked on the game. So that's my story. Thank you. Al, go ahead. My name is Al Cameron. I live just outside of Kamloops, British Columbia, where I grew up and threw my first rocks at the Calgary Cur at the Kamloops Curling Club so many, many years ago. Um, started out into curling uh, as a journalist as well. I covered uh, high-level curling at the Calgary Herald for uh, 13 years and got to uh, watch Amy win a lot of games over those years and then uh, joined Curling Canada as the Director of, Community of Communication and Media Relations in 2013. Thank you. And Lori. Hi, everyone. My name is Laurie Saint-Georges. Uh, I'm from Maba, Quebec. Um, so pretty much um, same as Amy, in the sense that I pretty much grew up in a curling club in Laval sur -Lac, and I'm curling now in Glenmore Curling Club. Uh, I'm still studying in journalism. Um, and I've been to three Scotties, if I recall, and, uh, I play also mixed double and mixed where, uh, we're going to represent Canada and mix the world mixed championship in uh, next October. So that's, uh, pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, very exciting indeed. And, and thank you all again for, for joining me. Um, I'm going to start with Al, how did you originally come to the sport of curling well like a basically the Kamloops curling club was uh, my babysitter both of my parents curled there and uh it's kind of one of those things they take you to the curling rink and they drop you off there and leave you to your own devices while they went out on the ice so uh gained a passion for the sport there uh played at a you know at a club level all my life and then, as noted, uh, I was a I was a sports writer for 26 years, and and covered a lot of curling, mainly when I was at the Calgary Herald for uh, 12 years, um, and got the opportunity to cover a lot of uh, Briars, a lot of Scotties, some World Championships, uh, the 2010 Olympics, and uh, through that uh, association with uh, with the sport as well as its uh, movers and shakers, I was able to. Uh, Cross to the so-called dark side of media relations uh, and uh, really just uh, so appreciative of the opportunity to, uh, you know, work full time in the sport of curling and work with our athletes, work with our clubs, work with our member associations, uh, uh, trying to move the sport forward in, in so many ways. And, uh, you know, we're baby steps here and there, some big steps here and there, but uh, always trying. Fantastic. Thank you, Al. Lori, how, how did you find the sport of curling? Well, as I said, I pretty much grew up in a curling club. So my dad was playing uh, with my mom in the league and then they moved in Laval and, you know, everyone in Laval sur -Lac pretty much uh, changed my diapers. <laughs> um, I was helping at the bar. I was not drinking, guys, but <laughs> I was helping at the bar, you know, doing dishes and whatnot. And um, yeah, honestly, my first competition was a uh, Jeux de Québec. And we finished last that year, but I loved it so much that I wanted to keep going. And my goal was actually to one day win Jules Quebec, you know, and that was the, my biggest dream. And after a couple of years, what I did it, and then like I started competition more seriously and whatnot. Um, well, I'll keep having fun, but you know, um, that's pretty much it. And you know, Laval sur Lac, it's pretty much like a family to me. So that's how I started. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. Um, Amy, how did you originally come to, to curling? 
Well, I grew up in Regina and I uh, slept with two chairs put together in the upstairs curling rink while my dad was curling. I remember learning how to read the scoreboard because I knew halfway through the game I'd get a chocolate bar. <laughs> I played Ms. Pac-Man, like that kind of stuff. So uh, I grew up in the game and then when I was about 14, decided uh, I wanted to focus on it. I was a dancer actually. Uh, so I quit dancing and decided I was gonna try curling because uh, they're exactly the same. <laughs> and then uh, from there, I went, I had the good fortune to play with a team that represented Saskatchewan at the Canada Winter Games. So most people wouldn't know that my first provincial jacket is green and gold <laughs> and moved to Calgary right out of high school and had the extreme good fortune of playing uh, for many years with Shannon Clybrink. So my first uh, Canadian championship as an adult was the 2003 Canadian Mixed, where uh, many people say Shannon was the first female skip. I was the first female second. <laughs> and people forget that. Uh, so I learned how to peel. Uh, and I learned took great pride in some of the skills I learned uh, playing second and mixed. So from there, I played in six Scotties. Good fortune to be on two winning uh, Scotties teams in one way or another. And played in a couple Olympic trials. I've lost some really hard games and, and I've been part of winning some pretty amazing games too. So I've worn the maple leaf, but I've experienced uh, the highest highs probably uh, in Canadian curling sport and some of the lowest lows as well. Okay. And, and, and thank you for, for joining us. So when did getting into our, our kind of topic of the day, um, when did each of you first notice sexism within the sport of curling and how, how did it manifest itself for you? How did you first notice it? Um, Lori, did you want to start? Um, yeah, so, you know, I think like sexism in sport in general, like I've always been aware of it kind of thing. Um, you know, even at school or whatnot, when they split the teams or, you know, making comments about like, if you're not good at throwing a ball or whatever, like you throw like a, a girl, whatever, I don't want you on my team, you know, that sort of comments like that. Um, but in curling, you know, I'm still pretty young and, but I've noticed a couple of things like, you know, when Rachel um, started to to curl and to win more events and more events and whatnot and people were like talking about her and her attitude and whatnot and you know that kind of like bugged me at one point you know I wasn't totally understanding because I was still really young but you know it was things like that just you know made me aware of um but one important thing that it was in 2019 if I recall when the purses got the equity of the purses for Scotties and Briar and I think it was the year that Chelsea won the Scotties uh Chelsea Carey won the Scotties and that year they came out with equity in the in the purses and to me it was like oh wow it wasn't and I didn't know it wasn't and it was a big gap like I think I read like the the article, it was kind of like $40,000 gap or something like that. And I was like, wow, this is a lot. And it's probably the, the first time that I really realized that, oh my God, like there's there's a really big gap between, you know, there's there's something wrong there. And how can, how can I, what can I do to help that situation? So, you know, I'm not an expert or whatnot, but I'm trying to talk more about it. But you know, those comments like this or hearing people talk about girls in sport and whatnot, it made me aware of. Um, but, you know, 10 years ago, I I didn't notice because it was so it was so much part of my life. You know, when you have so many comments, it's kind of like a natural, you know, oh, yeah, like I'm throwing like a girl. Oh, yeah. You know, I I'm not good at this. Like I throw like a girl like it just became normal to hear that. So I didn't notice a problem until that. So, okay, thank you for that, Laurie. That, that's, that's an important perspective from, on that front as well. Um, Al, when did you first uh, notice sexism in curling? Specific to curling, I mean, uh, it was always out there, right? I mean, uh, smaller purses at uh, at uh, World Curling Tour events relative to their uh, to the male events. Um, 
uh, to their credit, you know, the Grand Slams, once they allowed women into Grand Slams, they which took them a long time, but they were there, they uh, equalized the purses. And Curling Canada events that had both genders at them, such as the Canada Cup and Continental Cup, dating back to 2002, were always equal purses. But uh, as Laurie correctly points out, the Scotties and the Briar weren't equalized until 2019. But uh, in terms of sexism out and out, uh, and you know what, I'm going to play the Amy Nixon card probably a few times here because she's one of my dear friends and uh, she knows what I think about her, but she took the brunt of a lot of sexism uh, in her early days because she's got an attitude on the ice that is aggressive and awesome and competitive and forever. Those characteristics when ascribed to a male curler were considered admirable but when they're ascribed to a female curler and Amy uh, took the brunt to this were considered uh, reasons to criticize. And uh, I'll tell you the low point for me when I, when I came to realize that this is an uphill climb, it was, and Amy probably is thinking about this is Swift Current uh, 2016 World Women's Championship. And that was as low a night as I've ever had on the job with Curling Canada when uh, Amy got into a verbal uh confrontation not even confrontation she said a couple things that were caught on a hot mic about a russian curler who was doing stuff she shouldn't have been doing let's be crystal clear about that and amy said a couple words that again if ben hebert says that no big deal but amy said it and fans went off on social media and uh you know at curling canada we get copied on most of those things and it was that night at the championship banquet i just i was at a a real funk that Amy, to her credit, actually got me out of. She was uh, quite amazing that night, and I have such admiration for her as a human and a, as an athlete. And that night, seeing the vitriol from from fans that uh, for for such a innocuous thing on the ice that happens just about every men's game out there, there's going to be some sniping out there that uh, some some verbal jabs and because a female did it and uh, it was it was quite miserable and Laurie quite rightly points out some of the stuff that Rachel has, has taken over the years Chelsea Carey being another prime example of a a very competitive uh female curler that uh, and why do we have to keep using that word female in front of the word curler but it's it's still a thing out there and uh, you know it, it can't be it's got to stop well, thank you Hal and I, I think you've uh very ar ar articulately provided a, a solid transition to, to now hear from Amy on this one. <laughs> um, Amy, when, when did you first uh, first notice sexism and curling? I probably always noticed it. Uh, I think that um, I always uh, embodied a pretty fierce competitive uh, figure when I played at a high level. And I think even before there was television, uh, you know, I went out with an attitude of like, when uh, I wasn't really always excited about making friends. <laughs> uh, I had a mission and uh, I wanted to support that mission. So uh, not that I don't have friends or that I don't care about people, but when I played competitively, uh, I was there to try to win. Uh, so probably some of the most memorable things that I can come up with earlier in my career, keeping in mind that I went to, uh, first time I played on television was 2003 at the Canadian Mixed, back when it was on television, TSN. Um, and it was, you know, kind of more on the entertaining side of things, the amount of um, whining uh, that happened because, you know, Shannon was skipping and we had two male sweepers and it was unfair. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, that kind of uh, more on the um, entertaining, often it's not. Uh, the, the reality is that it's it's often um, not fun. And I think I was very fortunate that I played a good half, probably, of my competitive career away from uh, the, the evils of social media uh, and really got to experience that in the second half, probably, of my competitive career. And so I can kind of bridge both sides of that. I think too that when I think back to my first Scotties in 2004 and Red Deer, there was something at the time, and let me be clear, I am in my fifth year on the Curling Canada board. This I don't wish to trash uh, Curling Canada in any way, shape or form. I think they've done some really wonderful things. 
Uh, and they are one of the only sports, we are one of the only sports with equal purse, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there, you know, please don't take what I'm about to say, this is historical and not in the current members of Curling Canada's operations team. But in 2004, yeah, there was a heart chart that uh, was a newspaper. And in that heart chart, it listed who had the best smile and who had the best eyes. And of course, Shannon Clavering had the best eyes. Uh, and, you know, that kind of thing was real. And that was not at the Briar. <laughs> so it's like a small sliver of an example that I found quite interesting. And I think I embody, you know, I'm five foot one. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a lawyer. I am, I think, pretty intelligent. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of that kind of um, presence that is particularly jarring for some people that if I'm Ben Hebert, and I say and do the exact same things, I won't experience at all the uh, kind of vitriol that was aimed at me or my teammates. Like, I want to be clear that I think in some ways, I was probably more shelters a third than had I been a skip, that uh, Heather Nedouin being a fifth player for her and watching that in 2012 was something uh, trying to protect her from it where, where I could as a fifth player. Uh, that was an experience too. I agree with Lori's comments about um, Rachel. Uh, certainly uh, Chelsea, uh, I played with Chelsea. I, I think she gets um, lots of things coming her way that are just inappropriate and, and not warranted. I could add more. Like, I think what's really amazing when you look at someone like Caitlin Laws, who by all accounts is a pretty nice person, uh, in, you know, a, a fairly easy person to watch, <laughs> to curl in my experience. And she herself has faced some vitriol that I betcha a lot of money, somebody like Brennan Botcher wouldn't. Uh, so that's the kind of thing. And social media has not helped that. Uh, there's one of my favorite things about retiring from curling is escape from social media trolls. Yeah. And I, I think as we, as we go through our conversation, that, that difference between social media as it came through and it has become ever more present in our lives versus prior to that kind of has a, a significant effect on sexism, both in sport and outside of it, but also how much it's, it's prevalent in our lives. Um, particularly as, as professional athletes and semi-professional athletes in the case, you know, have, you know, are on social media and are subjected to this on, on a 24 seven basis, as opposed to just. Although know. Bill, I want to jump on to something that actually Lori said when we were just all introducing ourselves to each other sure. before we came onto the recording, which is, you know, I, I am so privileged <laughs> and um, my experience in the sport has been incredible. I'm so grateful for so many of the opportunities that I've had, but also I am somebody who walks through the world. I'm white. I'm, uh, I have a male partner. I am many things uh, without disability that make it really uh, much probably easier to face some of the challenges than uh, many folks. Like there's definitely a thing <laughs> where those who come from more and more of those equity deserving groups will be more likely to face discrimination, more likely to face violence, uh, whether that's verbal or otherwise. And so I just wanna acknowledge that I'm not here whining about my experience because I've had incredible opportunity in the sport. Uh, I'm just only sharing some of the journey. No, absolutely. And, and thank you, Amy. I think that's a really important point to make is, is the faces you see are all white. The faces you see are all cisgender and, you know, from various socioeconomic classes, right? And, and so there's those biases we have to lay on the table. Um, and it's also part of the point, right, of, of, of the Curling for Change podcast is to try and show these messages, but also why it's important to hear from other voices outside of that, from those equity deserving groups, as, as you said. Amy. And so, so I greatly appreciate that. Um, and I think similarly to, to Lori in that kind of generational sense, like sexism for curling in, in my eyes was made clear, you know, it, it's something that I kind of was aware of that was present, but very much when, when Chelsea went to Worlds um, and the social media vitriol <laughs> that came when Chelsea Carey's team at the time did not um, I believe did not make the playoffs and was one of the first women's team not to do so for X number of years. Please feel free to correct me on the record. Um, I just remember being, I might've been, I think it was 15 or 16 at the time for the record, but I was looking at Facebook going, 
oh, this is how nasty this can be. And I had not been exposed to that yet. And so, you know, again, that, that point of social media really um, kind of shining a light on, on how prevalent that is, but also opening the eyes for a lot of young people as well, who, you know, Amy, as you pointed to, this was still very much around and very much prevalent in very significant forms for a very long time. But as a young person who only came to the sport, you know, midway, came to the sport when I was 11, 12, I never really saw it until I was 16. Um, but it was certainly certainly a, a bit of a punch to the gut to see that in that form. Um, Al, go ahead. You know, it's, it, it's the disappointment in, in, in people uh, mm -hmm. that you, you'd like to want to believe the best in people. But uh, I was with that team, Chelsea Carey's team in, in Denmark that year. And, uh, you know, being on the receiving end of, of the social media of uh, that, you know, I was trying to help out on their social media feeds. And, you, you know, you, you can only tell them so often, don't look, there's nothing good that can come from looking. And it's, it's one of those things, if you accept all the compliments that you see on social media, well, you better be prepared to accept the other stuff. And that's, and but it's the other stuff that comes from the keyboard cowboys who don't have to identify themselves, the bots, the trolls. Um, the other incident that stands out to me is um, for, for a low point uh, would be the 2018 Olympics. Uh, Rachel Holman, when uh, the burned rock against Denmark. And I will go to my grave saying that uh, that was Rachel did everything correctly in that scenario, but. People just took that as an opportunity. And to refresh everybody's memory, it was a burnt rock by Denmark. The burn took place between after it had crossed the hog line and by the very flawed rules of curling, it's up to the non-opposing team to make the judgment. And that just puts the non-opposing, the non-offending team, pardon me, uh, to make the judgment on what happens to the rock. And that just puts a team in a terrible position. And that's where officials need to come out. But anyways, Rachel kicked the rock off. Uh, the Danes pouted very visibly for the camera and uh, the and Rachel just got destroyed on social media by many of her peers, too, uh, which so disappointed me. And again, it's one of those things. Would that have happened if that were a male team doing it? I have my doubts, sincere doubts. And and I do just want to pick up on a point that, that Al, you've just made there, but all of us have touched on it is that, you know, we're very lucky to be in a sport of curling where the, you know, the, the kind of welcoming inclusive nature of it generally is very significant in comparison to other sports in particular. This podcast exists because that's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination and we need to address that. However, if you're, if someone at home listening to this is struggling to perhaps understand sexism and curling or racism and curling or any of these things, perhaps in the, in the sexism case, speak and, and think to, for example, tropes and curling, or if a man does one thing and a woman does the same thing, how do we view those two things beside each other? We've already made the comment of if some comments are made by a man and then some comments are made by the woman, the same comments, they're not viewed the same way. Right. And, and well, we haven't even discussed the topic of screaming. We've gotten this far into it, <laughs> into the podcast. <laughs> And that's the thing that I wrote and that's got the most reaction. I mean, mm -hmm. that, there's a perfect example. I mean, yeah. It, oh, I have it, lots of things to say about that. You know that. <laughs> right. Right. And, and and this is one of the things that I would stress to people at home who are, who are listening or watching this is just take the time to look at curling and think about some of the things you hear that are said or the actions that are maybe joked about. Right or maybe highlighted on television, and ask yourself the question, would this be the same if a female curler did it? Some of the easiest ones are, do you comment on men's hair? Do you comment on men's makeup? Do you comment on men's jewelry? Do you comment on men's uh, fit of their clothing? Do you comment on how they yell? Do you comment on uh, how they interact with their teammates? Almost always the answer is no to all of those things, yet we see those things consistently being commented on with female curlers. Um, and consistently we see people commenting in very uncomplimentary ways about they should smile more, they should laugh more, they should be this, they should be that. And honest to goodness, that never, never happens if it's Kevin Cooey. And Lineup changes. There's another thing too, right? Yeah. 
female teams. Lori, you went through a lineup change, and yeah. it, it, there's there's landmines there that I'm sure you're aware of that a male team changes its lineup quite routinely. It's really not a thing, but when a female mm-hmm. team does it, Armageddon. Well, yeah, there's there's something wrong there or whatever, but it, to Amy's point about like commenting about the hair and whatever, and I sort of experimented during my first Scotties with the Elsa thing and whatnot. Um, and it was not in a mean way, and it's not totally sexism or whatever. And I, you know, I surfed on the wave because I felt like I had no choice to surf on it to either get sponsors or whatever to have visibility because it's the only visibility that I'm going to get, right? So I'm going to take advantage of it. But all the articles were about my hair, um, how do I smile, how, you know, we were having fun. But man, we were making shots. We were winning games. We were actually a really good team at that event and all the articles. And I kept saying to, to the media about how I was proud of my team and that we worked so hard for this, even during the pandemic and whatnot. And it was only about my hair, my hair and my hair. And I was like, you're missing the point there. I'm putting so much time. Like I'm putting so many hours to practice on the ice. And I spent two hours at the hairdresser you know, like it's, and it was the whole, the whole topic. And yes, we, I, you know, and because women in sport, we don't have that much visibility. We have more, but we have not as much as guys. And I felt, oh, okay, what a good opportunity. I have to take advantage of this because the chances are I'm not going to get this visibility in two years or whatever, or I'm going to, have to dye my hair blonde again, <laughs> you know? So I kind of experimented a little bit in that sense. It was not negative. It was it was not in a mean way. And I know that, but it felt just weird that the topic was more about my appearance, that I look like a princess and whatnot than talking about they won games, they're sharp on the eyes, they know what they're doing, they're getting experience, you know? So yeah. that was my point about that. Yeah, for, and, and thank you for, for speaking to that, Lori, because I actually, I wanted to ask about that as we were kind of going through, because I was like, I remember, you know, I, I've known Lori since we were rather young, and, you know, I was proud, to say the least, to see you and your team get to the Scotties first. And then it was just Elsa. Yeah. And I was and, like and and my team and my team felt a little bit that way, you know, like I talked to them after. Mm-hmm. And I was like I I felt bad and I tried my best to talk about our skills rather than or how do we appear on TV or whatever. You know, I was really trying to put them in front, but it was always about me and my hair and I was like it's it's not the point you know like we're still athletes i'm not a princess i <laughs> you know yeah it's it's like you know <laughs> kirk myers may look like prince charming but we don't call him that yeah exactly <laughs> right <laughs> right but and, and this happens right. all the time where we'll run into whether it's you with elsa which was the, the that's the biggest i've ever seen it in the curling world in terms of personality boom here you are we're going to describe you as as this disney princess because your hair looks like that right um and you were and this is the thing that that upset me at the time as you as you spoke to rather you know eloquently is that you know your team was performing amazingly and like me and my family sitting at home having known you we're watching going oh my gosh this is fantastic what an achievement wow how amazing this is but then as you rightly pointed out the story was just oh, you know, Disney Princess Elsa and the team are doing really well at a curling champ. Like, you know, and, and that wouldn't happen in, in the men's game. I don't mm-hmm. think, you know, please do correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it ever has. Um, 
but it may routinely happen and does routinely happen in, in, in the women's game. And, and thank you for, for speaking to that. And, you know, you're right. It, 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 at least from the media perspective, it wasn't a negative intent. No, right? exactly. And what, and what Amy said is true that, you know, um, when we're intense on the ice or if we, you know, a girl that swear is not, it's not nice. Like, you know, a woman who swears, it's not, it's not good. But that week I felt like I couldn't be mad at all. Even, even now I feel like I, I just can't be mad because I miss a shot, you know? And I, I don't usually get mad on the ice, but I feel like if at one point I, I do something like too crazy, like it's gonna, you know, I'm going to have a punch in the face like the next morning, you know? <laughs> mm. So what about Amy said, it's true. Like I, I felt, I felt that, that I can't, I cannot allow myself to be mad or to express myself, you know, sometimes when I'm, when I'm mad or when I'm really focused or, you know, mm -hmm. just intense. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, this, this may be a good moment. Um, Al, just to ask the question about the piece you had written um, at the Scotties about particularly sexism and curling. Um, where where did that come from for you? And, and why did you put pen to paper in that way, which I, I, I was very, I found very impactful? Um. Well, it had been brewing for a few years, obviously, based on some of the stuff that both Lori and, and, and Amy have talked about. And it uh, it seemed apropos. Uh, it was the International Day for Women and uh, that um, International Women's Day. And um, it, it it's one of those things that at the Scotties, it's we always I hate to say it. We have the over under pool and how many emails and phone calls we're going to get each day. Can you please take the mic off curler a curler b because it's making me it's turning people off and i just it's it's so disenchanting so and it's it's tiresome but then it goes beyond that well i mean there's had comments about tattoos on curlers i've had comments about um and, you know some of the stuff that's already been discussed here her hair her uh the way her clothing fits and it and and it's and it doesn't happen at the briar so we were midway through the briar and it just, it hit me. There, there hasn't been a single call complaining about a male curler on the ice, how they look, how they act, how they talk. And I'd already written that column that was in the Scotty's program. Um, so it, it was already kind of out there, but uh, it really had been the, you know, the ticket buyers at the Scotty's that had access to it. So I, I felt it needed a wider audience. It's stuff I've written before in the past as well. I mean, uh, it's always been a bugaboo for me that, uh, that there's a double standard for the way female athletes and male athletes are treated in the sport of curling, but not, I mean, as, as Lori and Amy both know, it's not a curling specific issue. This is in all sports. I mean, you watch tennis. Oh, why does she grunt so much? Well, listen, I watch men's tennis. They grunt a lot too, uh, but nobody talks about it. Uh, the prize money, obviously, in the LPGA and 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 PGA, such a broad gulf still. Uh, same with tennis, uh, WNBA versus NBA. This is not a curling issue per se, but specific to the world of curling. Um, yeah, it it needed to be brought out. Pro, to an audience and and Lori, you know, we talked about that before we started recording. Uh, a younger generation, it's probably not as big a deal to, even though there's probably some subconscious bias that's still out there that they don't even realize. But to an older demographic that still is a significant aspect of curling's fan base, it's still there. And I, you know, I. I we have a kind of a standing joke within our communications department that if you're getting a Facebook comment from someone who has a cat as their profile picture, you know, they're going to be launching bombs and saying some just mean, mean, mean crap. And um, it, that, the, the column uh, was in essence aimed at those folks. Um, now, did it make a difference? <laughs> it took me literally within 24 hours, I was getting the same kind of angry emails um, uh, and it just, 
it, it never ceases to amaze me that uh, that that people don't seem to get it. I'm looking for a specific email that I got within a couple days uh, of that uh, of that column, and it was just un freaking real. Here we go. And I'm going to read this. Uh, uh, it was from uh, Manitoba. I'm not even going to dignify the name of the town because I'm sure there's good people in this town. But this was uh, this was a couple days after I'd, I'd done the social media. And this it, some of this may come off as offensive, so I apologize in advance. But here's what this person wrote. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of media coverage regarding the treatment of female curlers and the frivolous comments and complaints about female curlers. I would like to go on the record, suggest that the media is a big player in this type of behavior. Every media, me, major media outlet regularly features a female curler bent over, delivering a rock or giving instruction with her mouth wide open. These are very provocative images that are often featured in advertisements in the pornography realm. In that context, an attractive young looking woman with her mouth wide open crouching is an invitation and notification that she is now ready to serve. This is disgusting and should not be tolerated. Why the open mouth? Totally unnecessary. I, I, I my jaw dropped when I got that email, and uh, I just, as much as you know, we're we're making progress in some ways. There's there's a huge contingent of people who think like that person, and like I said, it's. Uh, it's it's disenchanting a lot of days when you receive stuff like that. Yeah, I, firstly, thank you for reading that because I think it's important for people to hear it because it's those kinds of comments that are more prevalent than we would like to recognize that are often ignored or never heard that have to be addressed amongst other things, right? And so... As I sit and digest that for a moment. Um, uh, holy crap, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, uh, just, you know, I just want to get the reaction from, from Amy and Lori to those comments. Because, again, I think this is also an important point, is to me, it's shocking to hear that. Is it shocking to you to hear it, though, Amy? No. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, more than once, somebody on social media has said they want to shove a broom down my throat. Uh, I experienced in the Olympic trials in 2009 in Edmonton, uh, pretty well known, I will not say the name, uh, sports reporter who wrote an article about women only, their yells, and ranked them on urgency, annoyance, 1 to 10, ranked me 11, 11, 11, 11. Um, I had the good fortune of uh, Poor Al experienced this, but I then met that person in an elevator at the Scotties uh, in 2011, and Al happened to be a witness in the elevator. And I said, oh, I've been waiting to meet you in person. That was the most sexist, unreasonable thing that I've been subjected to in the sport. Thank you. <laughs> um, they are still a well-known sports reporter in Canada. Uh, so I think, no, I'm not surprised at all. Because <laughs> uh, although that particular egregious language has never been aimed at me that I'm aware of, I would not be surprised if it was. Yeah, and, and Lori, did you want to just react to that as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised to, I'm more, um, not emotional, but sad about it. It makes me nauseous. Uh, I, and you know, speaking for myself, I never experiment those type of comments. And I'm really, really fortunate. I experienced other things, but not that type of comments. And I cannot believe that it's still a thing and that it's part of, it's, it's part of like a culture, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it, it just makes me nauseous and I feel just so, so horrible and so bad for those like Amy who lived experience like this. And I really hope that people are hearing this and those experience and try to work on that and try to be more aware because there is one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to actually speak up and react when it's in front of you. 
and to actually say something when there's something wrong happening in front of you. You know, there you you can talk, but if you do nothing, you know, a culture doesn't change like this. You know, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. So uh thank you, Lori. I think that's a, a really important point to make for sure. Um and to anybody who feels perhaps how that person who wrote that email does, uh, I think perhaps you may want to look inwards to yourself as to the problem, as opposed to writing something like that to literally anyone. I'll just leave that one there. So we've talked a lot about our experiences and I wanna delve into this a bit and allowing you to describe two experiences with sexism and curling one that disappointed you, but one that perhaps empowered or inspired you. Um, Amy, did you did you want to start? Yeah. Well, when you 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 did share these questions in advance, which I always appreciate. That's professional and helpful. Uh, so I've had some time to reflect on this particular question, and I think it's an interesting one because I don't think you ever are empowered by discrimination. <laughs> and uh, so I, I'm not going to answer that portion of the question. I think I think that's not the case. You, you can become uh, more resilient by the challenges that you face, I suppose, or that you can be proud of facing uh, some of the challenges, but I don't think they are ever empowering. I don't think any of that is empowering. Um, I think the other piece we haven't talked about because I've had the experience of playing competitive sport with a young child, uh, so one of the examples I wanted to give was the number of folks who would ask my husband if he was babysitting. Uh, so I went to a world championship in Swift Current uh, in 2016. My daughter was nearly three years old. They came for some of that portion. And uh, and he was asked that numerous times. Um, but I think, again, kind of to Al's point, one of my most disappointing moments was uh, being at the Glencoe Club and practicing and throwing rocks and having a male competitive curler turn to my husband and, and jokingly say, oh, how's the babysitting going? Uh, and that's, that's, that is just, it was really disappointing to Mike. Uh, and it was really disappointing to me. And, uh, you know, I, I would flip this on to kind of like a positive lens where, and I want to say the name because I thought it was impressive uh, so Don Landry uh, does some uh, sports reporting and does uh, some stuff on Twitter. And he made a comment about um, uh, Jeff Walker babysitting uh, he and Laura's kids. And I made a I sort of direct message it and we were back and forth. And there's an example of somebody who said, holy smokes, I didn't think it through in the way that you're identifying to me. And I've had the conversation with somebody I trust in my life. And I, I, I see it and thank you actually for that gentle uh, kind of touch. And that's, that's the kind of opportunity with the right people. Some people are, are, are lost on it. Uh, so obviously the person that wrote what Al read uh, is probably not interested in a dialogue and a conversation, but there are a number of folks who I think you can dialogue with um, and who you can even challenge in a kind professional way and there can be some positive outcomes but to Lori's point you have to be willing to speak it and that has never been one of my one of my challenges uh I lived sort of very authentically as a curler I would say I was vulnerable when I was vulnerable I cried on YouTube I swore on the ice uh, I was just exactly who you would see uh if you had a beer with me uh, and so it was I I was very fortunate, I think, that I was in a space where I could just be who I was, but I also, as a result, I think had uh, sometimes some laser beams aimed my way because of it. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. I mean, and, and thank you for, for those points. Um, I would say for clarity that the second part of the question is kind of worded to get to the positive you spoke to, but it is very true. It is not exactly empowering to experience right, that prejudicial treatment or sexist treatment in that way at all. And, and thank you for, for articulating that. That's really important. Um, Lori, go, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Amy, for, for saying this, because it's it's also my my thought about it. Um, but it's, you know, like I said, I never really experienced, um, you know, a, 
not critical experience um, because every bad experience is a bad experience is how you feel at that moment and you know you have the right to feel that way um but for me it's more about when I play mixed doubles when with Felix and it's and totally another not topic but when I play mixed doubles and feel it with Felix I play the three rocks in the middle and he's throwing first and last and I noticed when we started playing that we were actually the only team who was doing that all the time. Like it's actually our setup. We're playing like this. And people started to ask me, why? Why do you do this? And I'm like, why not? Why not? Is it, be is it because I'm better throwing the first and the last and just not sweep or whatever? And they didn't really understand, like everyone is asking that question, why do you play like this? And to me, it's like, well, we're, we based our team on what's our strength, not on either weakness or what mixed double is supposed to be that way. So the, the female throwing the first and the last and the men, the three in the middle. And to me, I really, really take this as an opportunity to say, you're asking me why we play like this? Well, all right, I'm able to shoot as good as the other male can shoot on the other team. So he's throwing the three in the middle. I'm throwing the three in the middle. I take this as an opportunity. And I'm like, well, if if we can beat you, it's because it's it's equal. We're, we're just a different team. There's no, you know, and even when Amy talked about, um, talk about the mix and I talked to this to, to Felix, I'm like, people are expecting a mixed team to be a men's skip. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm sure I could skip or a mixed team and still win games. I'm sure, because I believe in my abilities, but people are expecting mixed team to be that way and a mixed double team to be that way and you know so that's pretty much my experience about it but I take this as an opportunity to just challenge myself so people maybe think that I should throw the, the first and the last because I can't throw that hard well I'll show them I can make some shots and I have confidence in myself right so I take this as an opportunity, but to me, it's crazy how we expect mixed double to be that way. Well, more before than now, now it's starting to change a little bit, but still, and especially mix that people are expecting to be a man as a captain. You know, mm -hmm. that's my, that's pretty much my thought about it. Um, but I take this as an opportunity, you know? Yeah. It, and, you know, I think part of the the really important thing that comes out of that as well is that, you know, one of curling's biggest problems is its tradition and its stereotypes and its tropes. Mm -hmm. And the longer people don't challenge themselves on that or ask the question of why is curling like this? Why do I think it has to be like this, right? As you said, Mixed doubles, you're, you're very right. That's what people expect on a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, why do we expect that? Mm -hmm. Why do we expect a team to be made that way or a mixed team to be made one way or another? You know, um, in one of our conversations, someone asked the question of, you know, especially for leagues at a club level, why are you gendering your leagues? Why? Is there any point at all in gendering your leagues in any way, shape, or form? Ask yourself the question, right? Particularly when you're playing doubles. Does it need to be mixed? Not really. Triples, right? Is that's growing? Does that need to be gendered in any way? Not really. You know, and kind of just walking, asking yourself those questions about some of the stereotypes and, and, and tropes that we have. Um, perhaps quickly you'll see some of the issues that we have to work on in curling, particularly related to sexism. So I, I really appreciate you speaking to that. And um, on, sorry, on that point, yeah. we're, we're pretty fortunate in curling because we have actually mixed, you know, I, I think it's, 
it's actually nice to just challenge yourself. So we're pretty fortunate to have those categories in our sports. Otherwise, amount a team. So in a team, sometimes it's not equal either between men and women. So is is and I'm not talking about our mixed team or whatever. I'm not putting anyone like under the bus or whatever, but yeah. in a mixed team, is my opinion is gonna be as valid as Felix's opinion? I know he's the skip in this case, but if it was reverse, would I feel like the pressure to oh I can't like call a strategy right because he's he's he doesn't agree or whatever, you know, it's so yes, we're fortunate because we have mix, but in those categories, there's some things that doesn't doesn't work and we have to work on. Yeah, absolutely. And and Al, do you want to pick up there? Well, I I feel a little bit of imposter syndrome here because uh, obviously I haven't had to live with these challenges at all. I've chronicled a few of them, but that's that's not the same. Uh, I've detailed some of the bigger disappointments, obviously, and, and they're not isolated incidences. Uh, I am gratified that, that there are so many strong women out there who do. And I loved Lori, that you said challenge. I love that, that challenging the traditions, challenging, um, uh, the way things should be you know and i put air quotes around that should be and they don't need to be that way and you know i i still go back to those uh that 2003 mixed team um that amy was on that uh, that really rattled a lot of cages and then and then uh shannon was able to win well she upgraded it second the year later and she was able to win the canadian mixed champ amy i kid because i love but shannon did win the canadian mixed curling championship in 2004 and timmins um and the first uh, and only female skip to win a Canadian mixed championship. And that challenged a lot of people uh, to, to rethink. Now, as Laurie quite rightly points out, there's work to be done. And uh, it's, it's uh, and yeah, we need to challenge people's attitudes. We need to challenge the way people think uh, and, and, and keep challenging and keep telling people that they need to think about things differently. Uh, Will, I loved what you said about, uh, about leagues. Why do we put these traditional categories on them? Uh, open leagues, what's what's the big deal? I mean, there just isn't a big deal. And I was fortunate enough to play at the Calgary Curling Club, you know, open league for a lot of years where, you know, there was there was four female players. There was three and one, two and two, three and one, and, and a couple of wheelchair teams in there as well. And it was one of the most positive curling experiences I've ever had. And I think uh, you're you're absolutely right that people need to, challenge the way they think about curling in the traditional sense yeah and, and i think the only thing i would add there and we spoke about this at length in our, our curling with pride episode was that you know not only do we need to challenge those traditional norms of curling from from that gendered lens but also if you have gendered le leagues within your clubs or gendered competitions you're also excluding folks who do not identify within that binary system and you may be excluding trans folks. You may be excluding uh, non-binary folks. You may be excluding segments of, of the population that do not adhere to that traditional norm. And that may also be something that people need to challenge themselves about to think think about that. Um, Amy, did you did you have something you wanted to add there? I was going to say something sort of controversial, probably. Sure. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is um, just anecdotally, personal yeah. experience. Playing at the character curling club in a league, which pains me. I go to have drinks. So the on ice thing is difficult for me um, just because I'm not good anymore. And that irritates me. And that's just a personal problem. It's not them. They're great. My team. <laughs> but um, It's interesting playing in an open league and looking at the playoffs and standing on a sheet of ice and looking around going, hmm, there are eight sheets of ice. There is three women on our team out of four back end is female and looking around on all of the other sheets four women in total and so one of the things I do wonder about is is there a place where uh for women's leagues because 
we can say the things that you just said, and I support what you just said, Will, that we need to make sure there's open leagues and that there's no expectation of certain positions or number of people that are, you know, female, male, or non-binary. We need to we need to leave those spaces very much open for folks. I do wonder though, and I think about young women in sport in curling, and I think about uh, sometimes um, women who aren't necessarily in a place where they feel totally confident or comfortable playing with men. And so I just I just want to be mindful about when I look around and I'm literally one of two female skips on eight sheets of ice, 16 teams. There's something going on there that is not as simple for me as what well, just doesn't matter. Well, it still matters. It's still mattering. <laughs> And I can't quite figure it out. And I'm not sort of saying there's any particular one reason for it, but I worry that we actually close the space potentially mm -hmm. to female curlers in a league environment if we're not mindful. That's all. No, it, it, and I think it's that's a really important point to make, Amy, because especially we're talking about curling for change. Well, what does that change look like? Right. And and, and how does that kind of manifest itself going forward? And whether it's open leagues or you know, one of the things we spoke about in our, our um, BIPOC curlers and curling episode was talking about the need to make sure that your curling clubs have the support systems in place to ensure that women, racialized curlers, uh, LGBTQIA2S plus curlers, and other members of different communities, and particularly diaspora communities, have supports within the curling club to feel welcome there, to feel as if they belong there, right? Because if you do not have those systems in place, well, your open league may look like you described, or you may look across your sheets and see a very white room, right? And having those questions or their conversations, because even exactly as you said, it's difficult to point and ask and what ascertain what's happening there, what the dynamic is, what might be preventing people from, you know, entering that space maybe then it's important to ask the question, right? And, and so I think that's that's a super important point that, that can't be lost on, on anyone at all. Um, so, so thank you for, for articulating that. That's, that's very important. Um, with that kind of in mind, why is it important to be mindful of and to address sexism and curling? Lori, did you want to start? Um, I mean, not only in curling, I know we're talking about curling, but just in, in general, right? Um, I think it's a, it's important to educate people on it. I'm still learning. Every woman is probably still learning about it, right? And try to educate people talk about it, be aware, be aware, think outside the box. You know, there's no wrong answer when you try to challenge um, a culture or like, um, how can I say it, um, a tradition, right? There's no wrong answer if you try to challenge these, right? Um, I think it's important to include everyone but also for the next generation you know i i i'm starting to actually like not coach but i'm doing curling camps and whatnot and i see during competition young girls who were at the camp and now they come and see me play during my competition they, they look for me and it's the first time that it happened to me this year that I'm, i feel like actually oh you know, they're, they're looking at me like we're, um, they want to be part of, um, women's community and curling and whatnot. And they're looking up to me mm -hmm. and I want to be a good model for that, for them, but I also want to educate them so that they can actually feel comfortable when they play on the ice, that they, they feel safe also that they do feel safe and that they can their turn later on in their career to continue to challenge those tradition, you know, cause it's not only, or 
roles you know it's a long process and we have to start now amy started years ago and i'm so grateful for it thank you so much for that but we still have progress and it's my generation and younger generation who needs to keep talking about it to to change mentality you know because it's it's no fun to to play a game that you love and not feel safe and not comfortable doing it we put so much time doing it and we want to have fun it's a game and if we don't feel equal it's it's not worth it right so yeah no very very well said Lori. thank you um amy I think we, we know statistically that young girls leave sport in droves and they leave sport in droves ish in grade seven. Uh, and so when I was reflecting on this question, one of the things that popped open for me was this, which is if it's not a place where they feel confident and empowered and where they can be themselves, uh, where they can uh, express who they are in a competitive environment, if that's what they want, that, that worries me, Broad, more broadly speaking, because we know actually there's some great uh, stats out there that female CEOs and female executives, a large portion actually are athletes historically. So all of this to me, for me is tied together in women's leadership and women's impact uh, in sport, but certainly beyond. And so when I think about how important it is, it's there in our young girls. It's there in our young men. It's young women, young men, non-binary, all those folks actually will carry all of the things that they experience. But my biggest concern is that we lose girls from, from sport and from opportunities to compete. And that then ties into success later on in life. The other thing, obviously, from somebody who was very, very, very privileged to wear a maple leaf on my back and play um, for Canada is that... You know, I think we need to be allies to those folks when they play. And uh, I did step forward when Rachel's team experienced a very difficult Olympics in 2018. And even I, by, by tweeting at them some quotes, received some vitriol as a result of trying to lift them up. And I think we all have a responsibility where we see it to come in and, and lift athletes up. Uh, especially when they're experiencing tough moments. And that can be at the uh, Canadian championship level, the international level, whatever. Um, and, and I think that's, if I could ask for one thing for athletes, young and high, high performing, it would be that we all, and me included, try to step in and lift them up when they're having a, a hard moment. Uh, so I think that's way a conversation around, different aspects of identity and uh, the way people are in the world and how they experience discrimination, uh, even violence because of who they are, is important for bigger, broader conversation around whose voices get heard, who gets to lead, who gets to be a part of conversations. No, absolutely. And, and thank you, Amy. And I think one of the things, whether it's whether it's sexism or whether it's we're speaking about the 2SLGBTQIA plus community or racialized peoples and curling in particular, as well as that, you know, allyship doesn't end in those hard moments. It's critical in those moments, as you rightly pointed out, but it doesn't end there. And so people listening to this conversation, you know, ask yourself, you know, perhaps how you can be a better ally to, to folks who may be, um, struggling within your curling community or within your community more broadly, or who may be members of marginalized communities, or, you know, one of my main lessons coming out of these podcasts for people is you do not know the person who's coming through that door of your curling club. You know nothing about them other than they're, they're coming to curl, right? You don't know what they've experienced. You don't know what harm they've faced or may be facing in the broadest of senses, right? And to, to be an ally starts with that place of putting your biases on the table as we did at the start of this conversation, but also bringing yourself to a place of empathy before you consider anything else. And, and you know, that's where that starts. But of course, conversations like these lead to a, a more comprehensive understanding of what that looks like. And, 
you know, thank you for, for highlighting that. Al, why is it important? Well, initially, I was going to talk about Amy's own daughter, Callie, there, who we've seen poking in and out. And obviously, it's important for, for girls like her down the road. But I'm also starting to think of, uh, of people who've come before Amy and, and Lori and, and, and their peers. Uh, you know, I'm thinking to, uh, to Colleen Jones, Sandra Schmirler, Vera Pezzer, uh, you know, Connie Laliberti, Linda Moore, Lindsay Sparks, uh, all these uh, amazing, amazing curlers, Mabel DeWare uh that uh you know from your part of the world will uh that went out there and and played their hearts out played with passion and uh didn't get anywhere near the recognition that they needed to and, and again this is this goes beyond uh beyond curling uh, uh you know uh, marie claude Esselin, we member of the canadian skiing hall of fame perhaps uh i don't know if we should say perhaps your future mother-in-law i don't know uh maybe too soon too soon too but that soon. felix's mom <laughs> yeah felix's mom one of the greatest skiers who's ever lived but uh you know not talked about in the same breath as a as a ken reed a steve podborski uh, uh you know these these trailblazing women uh that need to be honored for what they did back in the day uh we need to to recall and take steps to make sure they're honored and 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 recognized for for the sacrifices that they made and uh, and Amy talked about wearing the maple leaf, and and uh, you're going to get that chance very soon, obviously, uh, you know, over in Scotland. And um, I consider that one of the most noble things that one can do in sports is to wear a maple leaf on your back. Uh, I, I I've struggled to think of anything more noble, uh, actually, in our sport. And uh, those people that do that, they need to be recognized and and honored. And and Think about what you say about them because they are doing something that the reward really, honestly, doesn't come close to the sacrifices they made to get there. And uh, I just hope that, uh, you know, uh, I, Lori, I just, I, you know, I'm going to be cheering for you hard. And uh, I just want everybody to think about that when they go on to social media. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're saying about our athletes. Think about what you're saying. Uh, if you're not going to say it to their face, don't say it on social media. That's always my piece of advice. No, and, and and I think that's critical that that piece of of recognition that you mentioned, Al, is that recognition we often kind of glance at as like, oh, well, we they won something or they did something cool and we've honored them enough with that. No. You know, how many things in society are recognized or named for men and how many are named or recognized for women? Ask yourself that question. I mean, as you mentioned, Al, I'm able to wear in the province of New Brunswick. Has she been recognized sufficiently outside of curling for her contributions to society? No. No. Um, so, you know, there's these conversations that, that kind of are, are, are important to, to mention in terms of recognition of, of people's impact in, in sport, but also, you know, how we, how we recognize women in, in, in our society, in our sport versus, versus men. So um, the very last thing I want to ask is, you know, how the curling community can act to, to eliminate sex, uh, sexism in sport. Um, you know, where, where do we go from here, essentially, is, is the question. Um, Al, did you, did you want to start there? Well, I did you know, specific to, to fans, I, I kind of said one of my pet things is if you're not going to say it to a person's face, don't say it on social media and ask yourself those questions that we talked about at the very beginning of the pod here. You know, would I say that about a man? Would I talk about the way that man is dressed? Would I talk about a team's lineup change about a men's team the same way I'm talking about this women's team? Ask yourself that question, challenge yourself. Um, I think that's a, a simple step, but boy, it, it's a, it's a, it's a big leap to take when you're in the moment and sitting in that keyboard or having your thumbs on your, on your, on your uh, iPhone or Android device that uh, it's so easy, right? It's so easy to say something and, and just let her rip. And we gotta, we, we gotta develop a filter, an internal filter and think about things that we say before we say them. Thank you, Lori. How, how can we eliminate sexism and curling going forward? I I totally agree with uh, with Al. I don't, and I really do hope so. Will that it will one day <laughs> there is not going to be sexism, but 
you know, I don't think, honestly, I don't think it's going to happen. I think there's always, there are always going to be not only men, even women sometimes that's going to make comments or whatever, um, inappropriate comments or, you know, that they don't think before saying things. Um, but as I said, um, you know, just, you don't know the person, you don't really know the person who you're talking to, right? So you don't know their, the, their background and whatnot. You don't know what they've been through before. So just be kind, be kind to others, be kind to yourself too. Cause when you receive those comments or whatever, it's, it's easy to be, to be hard on ourselves and to sick and doubt yourself. Sometimes it's good to sick and doubt yourself, but sometimes just, you know, be kind to yourself. It's not, it's not my fault if I have a high pitch and I don't know if Gerard doesn't want to play beside me in the league because I'm screaming too loud, like, you know, but be kind to others, be kind to yourself. And yeah, think twice. It's like Al said, it's, it's easy. You're on the heat kind of thing. You're upset, but think before. Worst case, just put it in your notes, <laughs> take an hour off, <laughs> check it out after and, you know, think twice before. <laughs> Thank you. An, an important point for sure. Amy. How can we eliminate sexism in curling going forward? So I have two comments. The first is, uh, I'll mention my daughter, who's 10. And one of the reasons I uh, decided to say yes to this opportunity was because she's been listening. <laughs> and, uh, and we talked in advance about some of the examples that I might um, key in on and, and be able to contribute to the conversation. And I think that's important. She's 10. She's able to understand and engage in the importance of the conversation. That's number one. Uh, and then my other piece is, um, I think there's an opportunity to help young curlers and those who play at a high level make decisions, smart decisions about social media engagement. And we have to be realistic that there has to be some level of engagement for teams because they have to brand and market and they need sponsors and they need exposure. But I do think training around social media, I do think support for teams, just like Al tried to do with Chelsea Carey's team in Denmark, uh, is key to trying to get folks um, focused on the mission rather than the noise. <laughs> uh, and so we need to, I think, uh, as sort of provinces, territories, and nationally, when we are dealing with young folks, try to lead by example around that, try to give them opportunities to learn, make goals around social media when they're going to major events, which could be a provincial or, or a territorial event for some of them, for example. Uh, but realistically, social media is not going to go away and trolls are not going to go away. And so I think it's as much about trying to um, fill the, the negative with positive and kindness, to Lori's point, where there, we see the opportunity to kind of battle it back for people with people. And then I think the other piece is to understand that it's unfortunately a real part of the game uh, for people who play at a high level and then help them develop strategies on how to filter it. Because I saw somebody I was playing with at a world championship be super impacted um, by it. And I tried to block people all over Twitter, for example. I was not as impacted uh, because I had come to expect it. <laughs> and I think also I sort of don't need everyone to love me. Uh, and I wasn't invested in my brand actually compared to where I think you have to be today. I am a dinosaur now a little bit, not that I'm old, but I'm certainly not 25, Larry. Right? <laughs> and so I think being realistic about, it's easy to say, don't be on social media, that's not realistic. So giving people tools and support is more realistic. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and being there to support our athletes and our young people in particular and our, our high-powering athletes, but also 
you know, as we all mentioned in different ways, you know, supports for folks coming into curling who may not be as welcome or may not be as historically welcomed in our, in our curling communities is something that's super important going forward. And I think, you know, Lori's point to, to the question is that sexism may never be eliminated for curling, but we can all do one heck of a job and an effort in our own lives and our own ways to try and be kind to one another. As you mentioned, Lori, I think it's a really, a really powerful message coming out of it but to be empathetic with people and lay your biases on the table, as I mentioned earlier, and as we've all spoken to in, in separate ways. But I think, you know, first of all, you know, Amy, thank you for, for including your daughter and hearing that conversation and participating in it. I hope others do the same because they're important conversations for anybody at any age. Thank you all for joining me and for trusting me with this conversation. I greatly appreciate it. And I hope folks at home appreciated it as well. Um, again, if you enjoyed this conversation, please do share it, do like it, do send it to someone you know, um, so we can all work to change the face of curling. This has been another episode of the Curling for Change podcast on sexism and curling. My name is Will Robertson. This has been Al Cameron, Amy Nixon, and Lodi Saint-Georges, and we'll see you next time.